without further ado, Johannes Betts. Yeah. Take okay. yeah. Thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, for the invitation, of course. And yeah, thanks uh, that a lot of people came here because I'm, I'm always excited to talk about this topic. So I think probably all the people that are here are have some affiliation with motorsports, probably. So because then they wouldn't be here. So myself, I'm, I'm very interested in motorsports. Um, I did like as a hobby. I like to game motorsports games, like to ride motorcycles. I was like searching about where does like motorsports come from? And that's a car from the 1930s. And when we started with automotive technology, right? So we invented the car. What people did in the next place, they raced against each other. <laughs> so the question was like, why do you do that? Because they wanted to show the supremacy of technology. Because in 1900, there was something else there, the horse or the train. And everybody said like, why do you need the car? Why do you need the car? We have the horse. The horse is better. It's like people said, no, there's technology. This is better. And I can prove it to you. Let's race against each other. That is like where motorsports coming from. We prove the supremacy of the technology. When we look at motorsports right now, or the last couple of 20 years, and I have Formula One is my prior example here. Formula One is about technology, but just like 10%. Formula One is about about safety development, about new vehicle technology development. What you see here, the halo technology introduced like a couple of years ago. Formula One right now is not going out and racing. Formula One is having like six different tires, tires from soft, medium, hard that you can choose and that you run the car on. Formula One is about having a team, a thousand man company behind you, a team of like 30 people at the track, gathering data, having a look at the car. Formula One is about training in a simulation environment, hardware in the loop, software in the loop, driver in the loop. And finally, on the right side, what you can see Formula One is about money. It's not about technology anymore. It's about earning money. It's about making money. It's about displaying yourself. Um, I know a lot of people that work at BMW Motorsports, Audi Motorsports. So two years ago, they told me when they search for a new driver, they don't look about who's the fastest driver. They look about who's the fastest driver who has the highest social media rank. That is what motorsport is about today. And when we look into the future, I don't know what's coming. So on the left side, you see the Red Bull X1. It's like a concept car from Red Bull developed for the Gran Turismo racing game in 2010. This could be the future. Okay, We have like futuristic cars. You see like the tires are covered. Um, the driver is completely covered with super aerodynamic faster than before. Or what you see on the right side, which is like for me, one of the most interesting topics right now, that's AWS live real-time analysis of the driver behavior in Formula One. What we see here is like braking and um, speeds in a turn. AWS has a contract with Formula One and it's getting real-time data from the, from the car and can do some machine learning technology applications, can some calculations and figures out what is the car doing at high performance? Could be the future. Today, I would show you my vision of the future, which is quite different because we are doing it with autonomous cars. And therefore, my talk today is autonomous heavy handling, um, winning the Indy Autonomous Challenge. So what I will show you today is, um, first of all, why do we want to do that? Why, why is it interesting? So I told you before, we did... Um, in the beginning, it was all about technology, and you will see here we do the same. Then I will show you a little bit of a little bit more about autonomous racing. We go into detail of the software stack I created with my team in Munich. I show you some examples from simulation testing, and finally, what's coming into the future if you are interested in this field. So we will like in the next hour to talk completely about this topic, and I hope we can go into detail. So the first question today is like. Why do we want to race? Why do we want to race in autonomy? So when you look at Formula One, we have three different parts that make Formula One quite unique and quite exciting. The first of all is like detecting the vehicle limits. We have like 22 races. 22 races means 22 different racetracks, 22 different conditions, high speed, low speed, high acceleration, low acceleration, high grip, low grip. Every time we come to a track, our car has a different vehicle setup. Our car behaves differently. We have different tires, different car setup. That means every time we need to adapt ourselves. 
Number two, which is like for me the most interesting one, what you see here is Spa from Short. It's like racetrack in Belgium. That's the famous Eau Rouge. So the car here is running 300 kilometers an hour and he's overtaking somebody in this left right turn. So the driver needs to figure out the high prediction uncertainty. What is the other car doing? And then what we don't see here afterwards, we see like a long straight, which means you have to decide about the energy the car is taking. Do I stay on the left side? If Is the other car overtaking me again because I was able to overtake him here? Or what's my overall strategy in the race? So decision-making at the vehicle limits. And finally, what you see completely on the right side, that's Monaco. Monaco racetrack, super narrow. The walls are directly next to you, which means one, wrong steering input and you crash into the wall and you see the car slightly drifting here so we have high speeds and higher accelerations and we have like a high planning horizons necessary with small reaction times which means we need to handle at the limit and that's like three unique parts we don't have anywhere else in a normal street scenario we don't have that and if we cover all these three points we have a very exciting opportunity for autonomous vehicles because when we think now about, let's do everything in an autonomous car, what is the goal? Our goal is, first of all, that we race like we see it in other racing series, like Formula One, NASCAR, the Indy series. And then we want to race at high speeds. We want to do overtaking maneuvers. We want to do blocking maneuvers. We want to have like tactics. We want to have multi-vehicle interaction, right? One car is overtaking the other, is blocking the other car is making probably a move. And everything you see, we want to do completely autonomously. And that's the goal. That's the goal of autonomous racing. And what you can see here on the left side are two examples. One is from our F1 Henska, and one that's what we will see further um, um, in the talk is about from the Indy Autonomous Challenge. So that's our goal. And now is the question, where are we right now? When, where are we right now is what you see here in these images is um, that all these autonomous race cars on the racetrack they make stupid things. You will see that in your course that robotics, we, we learned a lot about robotics, okay? So we know a lot about perception, planning, control. But driving with a robot very stable is sometimes is still difficult because even the slightest issue and slightest wrong calculation, your car is doing something stupid and crashing into the wall. And the most interesting one is this year because just look at that, the car is starting right away. It's making a turn to the right and crashing right into the wall. So something a human race driver would never ever do, of course not. Um, so that's the reality where we are right now, but that's fine. I'm not shitting about the others. It's just about, it is a difficult problem to at least drive the car and you see that in your course, right? So follow the wall, very good. When you move then to the next level, when we move to maps, when we move to localization, you will see it's getting much more difficult. So the first learning for you today is that comes from me, and I'm very serious about that, and I think I can, can confirm that with a lot of things. In autonomous racing, it's not only about perception, planning, control. That's like the foundations to make the car drive. But to drive fast, to drive at high speeds, we need sophisticated algorithms on a complete different level. We need to cover the complete big dynamics. That's what, we, what I discussed with you in, in our lecture. We need a highly reactive software and this software needs to run fast, okay? So if you, for example, think about, oh, Jesus, I found on a GitHub repository, this cool MPC controller, which is like super sophisticated and gives me like the best path planning, but it runs with one hertz, forget it. <laughs> it's like not working in this case. And what you will see along the talk that I'm using techniques which are like quite standard, but are lifted to a higher level of sophistication, but it runs fast. Because what you see then later, if we have these high speeds of like 250, 270 kilometers an hour, you have not enough time to do the calculation. But, and finally, and that's for me the last point, because sometimes people forget that, right? When we do racing, like let's be Lewis Hamilton, let's be Max Verstappen. And I say all the time, yeah, that maybe is the role model because we have it in normal autonomous driving too, right? Everybody can drive a car here. But everybody here in this room is not a race driver because those F1 guys, right? They started when they're like five years old. Then they started with karting and moved to Formula 3, Formula 2, and now they are in Formula 1. 
Lewis Hamilton, seven times world champion, has like 30 years experience. Think about that. Like, how do you incorporate 30 years of experience into coach? And then what I said in the beginning, they have like a company behind them, thousand man companies. They optimize for Monaco next week and they optimize for Spa in two weeks. And then we move on to the racetrack itself. I'm not sure if you have seen a Formula One race. The race driver is constantly talking to his race engineer. Like, oh, dude, there's something wrong. Brake bias. Give me some updates. Okay, okay. 10 people looking what's wrong with the car and give the feedback. And the driver itself is optimizing the car for each turn. Brake bias, energy balance, acceleration, differential is optimized for each turn. And just let that think, like think about that. How do you incorporate something like that into code? It's super, super difficult. And again, finally, it's a billion, billion dollar industry, right? It's not about like, oh, I just had a cool idea. Let's try to figure that out. You compete against a billion dollar company or a billion dollar industry. So that's just hard. So for me, um, the F1 driver is the future, but we are not quite there yet. And that's okay. It's not an issue. Okay, so first of all, now I gave you the introduction about what we're doing in autonomous racing. So everybody's on the same level. What is our goal? And now it's time to have like a look what is already there. Autonomous racing is very, very uh, strongly related with the research industry. So we have researchers all over the world that cover this topic. And for example, in the last 10 years, we see an uprising number of papers. So currently you find like 240 papers related with this topic heavily connected to the um, field of control and path planning because that's the most interesting one when it comes to high speed driving because you want to stabilize the car. We see very, very less topics in perception. There's like non, nobody out there that did a high speed object detection at 300 kilometers an hour or visual odometry or localization at 300 kilometers an hour is not there. I've never found it and we, we saw that for drones, but not for cars, for example. And then, for example, what is like also interesting, the reinforcement learning and end-to-end -end approaches where we have a deep neural network that is like trying to figure out from the image to the pixel or pixel to pedal. That's a topic which is like currently heavily emerging because the racetrack gives you one objective, the lap time, and that you can use for your reinforcement learning algorithm to train. We have in this, in this field, we have like a big community right now, which is growing. Um, we have F110s, of course. Then we have, since last year, the so-called EV Autonomous Grand Prix. Um, our lab is currently setting up a team. You are, of course, invited to, to join this team. We race in Purdue in May. We build a go-kart. Then we have Formula Student. Um, I think Penn has also a team. I'm not sure if it's like Formula Student Driverless here too, but Formula Student Driverless is like where university teams compete against each other and build this whole car. And then we have the two big companies. One is called RoboRace, that's what you see here. And the other one is the India Autonomous Challenge. And that's the title of the topic today. So two years ago, um, the India Autonomous Challenge was created. Um, in Indianapolis, they got a lot of funding and said, we want to create an autonomous race. So more or less, there was like the DARPA challenges in the middle of 2000. And these, this race is like the successor of the race. Uh, it was like the successor. We started in January 2020, and the race was um, just a couple of months ago. So we had like two years with multiple rounds. And 30 universities worldwide said, I want to take part in this competition. And that's the nine teams you see here on the right side. So we had a company from University of Virginia. We had uh, European teams from two teams from Italy um, in cooperation with ETH. We had my team from Germany. We had one team from Korea, we had an MIT team. Um, so teams from all over the world said, we wanna take part in this competition. And finally, there was like a $1 million uh, price tag, which is quite interesting because if you put a price tag on it, people are getting super excited and wanna win the thing. So the car we got is an Indy Lights car. So it's a pretty standard chassis. So you can buy this Indy Lights car, it's like a, a $100,000. Um, you get an engine, you get a transmission, it's like a combustion engine. And then um, with the help of Clemson University, they remodeled the car and made an autonomous race car, an autonomous Indy car, all of that. So we had a GPS, we had radar, we had LiDAR, we had camera, everything you probably saw in our electric tube. And with one um, high performance computer inside the car. 
And that's what we what we used, right? Real hardware, a big vehicle um, is that's more or less what you can buy and where the indie lights people race with right now, just autonomously. And of course, that's the livery um, from, from my car in Germany. Um, we had, when it came to the race, um, the plan was at the beginning that we raced with 10 cars <laughs> head to head. So guess what? That didn't work out <laughs> for several reasons because some of the teams um, were not able to do this multi-vehicle interaction. Um, some of the teams were not even able to race with the car. You saw that in the beginning. And again, it's not that I'm like shitting about those teams. It's just like, it's, it's a difficult topic. And even two years running with real hardware is quite difficult. So what we did in the end in Indianapolis, um, we had a qualification race where we had single vehicle and tried to achieve a fastest lap time. And then we had like a static obstacle avoidance afterwards, what you can see here on the right side where our car needs to detect the object and make an evasive maneuver. And in the race itself, we had a single vehicle which was running um, three lap times. And then we, we tried to figure out like what, what is the fastest car from a single vehicle perspective. And that was the race in Indianapolis. But three months later, we decided we want to do that again. And then we made a multi vehicle one. And that's I, what I will show you later. Um, just to give you an impression about how these teams are set up, that's my team from Germany. That's the team from, from Euro Racing, um, which is like Italy and ETH um, combined. And on the right side, you see the team Polymove, um, also from Italy. Um, those are the best three teams. So place one, place two, place three. And why I wanted to bring that to you is like to show you what kind of manpower is behind that, right? All of the teams had like 10 to 12 to 13 PhD students, had like undergraduate students that helped them, uh, invested a lot of money. Um, you can just imagine like if, if one PhD costs you $100,000 or $120,000 a year, you spend like one and a half million just for manpower. <laughs> so you have like this high investment, but it's necessary to be successful. Um, it's just like, that we saw that you need this kind of investment for people and know how uh, on a PhD level, so people invest, right? And they bring like all the knowledge from their graduate studies already with them and um, put some manpower inside. And also big different, and it's also like a big learning from, from motorsports. And I, if you're like interested in going into motorsports someday, you need experience, okay? Somebody, uh, again, I know a lot of people that work there, but I would tell them like, hey, could I get a job? They would probably say no, because I don't have the experience. So all the people that work in motorsports step up, right? They started like with karting or they started even like as a volunteer race engineer in a low level, low level class, because what you need here is experience. Because one thing you don't have when it comes to race is time, okay? So you see your car is doing something stupid. You need like one look at the data. That's what we do. There's no like, oh, now let's discuss one hour. There's no time for it. And all the teams here you see, they all brought prior experience within the race. And that's why they were so successful. Okay. Um, now uh, what I want to do with you, now you got like the idea of being the autonomous challenge and what autonomous racing is. Now I want to give you a detailed view on the software we use and why the software is so successful. So first of all, what we normally do, and I think that's that's very familiar to you, we split our code into perception, planning, control. That's what you will always see, a Waymo car, a Tesla car, every car has perception, planning, control. What you see inside is different components. You have like one component for localization, one for the detection, then the planning, then the control, and of course, the hardware around it. So the first highlight here, that's how our software looks like, okay? Um, so I give you a little bit of time to read that. First of all, we have like the sensors. Um, that's probably quite different from what you see in the if F1 Tens car. So in the F1 Tens car, we don't have like a GPS. We also don't have like a radar, right? But in that case, we want to have the full range of sensors. So we don't we don't want to have like we don't want to spend all the money on having the best sensors at the best quality because we're driving at high speeds. So the first thing, which is like quite different. For example, a Tesla is, or Tesla, what is currently trying to do is focusing on camera only, right? Is 
totally understandable because they want to sell the car, right? And less components means um, less hardware means less money. That's good. But in our case, money is not the issue. We want to have high computation power. We want like all the information. When we localize the car, we detect the objects. Then we make prediction for something we did not cover in the lecture so far. But in, in both the street scenario and in the racing scenario, we need to detect what other, uh, um, other objects are doing in the future. Then we do the planning. That's where the matching happens for race car. And then we control the car. So first of all, when we look at the localization, we see that we fuse all the information we get from the sensors. So number one is the GPS information. That's the most reliable, most accurate one, but GPS is dropping out sometimes. So what do you do when it drops out? You use the information from the IMU, you calculate your odometry. That is not quite accurate. So what you then do is using LiDAR information and the track layout and fuse everything together and then you get an accurate position. The advantage here, if some of these sensors is dropping out, you always have other sensors that give you a high precision quality where you are right now. Number two is the object detection. Object detection in that case means at like 100 meter, 120 meter in the, in the future, we want to still detect the objects. Of course, if we are not super accurate, like two centimeters or five centimeters, that's fine in our case because we always plan with some discrepancy to the other car. But what we need to do is detect them as soon as possible, right? Because then we can plan our path along it. And that's what we need at high speeds. In our case, we heavily rely on LiDAR and camera data. There's like one algorithm out there, it's called Point RCNN. You can download that. Um, researchers develop that, deep neural network based. You can retrain that, and that's what we use here. So nothing super special, nothing super fancy, but reliable and fast. Number three is a development from our side. That's for the prediction of other vehicles. What you can use in the prediction is, of course, classical Kamel filtering, but in our case, be using a deep neural network approach. And what we do here, because the racetrack gives us this unique environment where people might behave differently, that we have a so-called online learning adaption. That means if we see another car, we can overfit our neural network to this car only. And what you see on the right side, that's like the output of this prediction network. So this is quite unique. So it's, it's state of the art right now that people can do that. But what the, the advantage of this approach is that is you reduce the uncertainty of the other vehicle's behavior. And that's what makes it so unique here. So we overfit to other vehicle's behavior, update all the information online while we train the network or while we inference the network and therefore have like a less uncertainty of the other car's behavior. And that's what we need. Because having the high uncertainty of the other people's or other opponent's trajectory gives us less opportunities to plan a good path, path around it. And that's what we wanted, that's what we need in the end. Yeah. There are the so the network itself um, stays the same, but you switch layers in the network in the end. So more or less the last layers were switched with observations from the other vehicle you see right now. So you see like a specific vehicle has some observation and you use that in the last layers and update more or less uh, the prediction loss. That's what you do. And that's what, what online learning is. You have different techniques to do that, but in this case, it was more or less to focus on specific behavioral behavior that other people have. And another quick question. Yeah. Like, is the hardware and sensors, like for like any for example, like, um, restricted to the number of cameras you put on the Yeah, correct. Okay. Hardware is for all the pieces same. Um, the magic one is in the software. And that's where like people um, yeah, separated themselves from, from each other. Um, in the next um, uh, part of our software, we are going into the planning part. And what we did, we split it into global planning and a local planning. So global planning is on the left side, what you can see here, think about you driving alone around the racetrack. There's like no obstacle around you. So what you are achieving 
is to drive as fast as possible, which means we want to race on the so-called race line because that's the fastest line around the track. Unfortunately, we can define the race line uh, with different objectives. So, for example, a race line could be the shortest path around the track, right? What you see here on the right side, the blue line, shortest path, so-called Dijkstra algorithm, you minimize the, the, the path term. The second one is called minimum curvature. Think about you steer with a car, and we want to minimize the steering and peak in each turn. What we then do, we create like a high acceleration in the turn and minimize the steering. That's minimum curvature. What you see here on the right side, that's the orange line. But the most sophisticated one, that's the minimum time problem or so-called optimal control problem. And that means in our case, we created an optimization environment or an optimization problem that's minimizing the car for the time travel. Therefore, we have the fastest lap around the track. This um, optimization is nonlinear because we are using, and remember from the lecture, a double track model of the car. Therefore, we model all the tire dynamics, we model all the tire behavior, like everything the car does, and get afterwards an optimal control output. And that's the optimal control problem we created. And then you get the green line, and that's more or less the path and the velocity profile you want to achieve, or which is like the highest one. A special topic here is one algorithm we developed, which is calculating the friction. So remember from the lecture, I showed you that the tire and the road creating a friction, a one friction value together. And we don't know how high this friction value is. Of course, on the race track, it's very high. But we don't know how warm the tire currently is. We don't know if there's like any dirt on the track. So what we created is like a tire performance assessment model. So we race around the racetrack and we estimate this value into the future. And we predict that value into the future, for example, with camera data. And we can estimate it when we drive the car over the street or over the racetrack. What you get afterwards is something like you can see here on the right side. That's like a tire friction map or a road friction map over the complete racetrack. And the areas where it's red, we have like high friction. And the area where it's like yellow or even blue, that's like low friction. And I want to focus, especially here, on this area here. That's a fake oil leak. So we created a simulation where you can see the car is not driving to the left, it's not driving to the right, it's running completely over it with the tires on the left side and the right side. Because in that case, that's like the fastest lap, that's the fastest line around the track. And that's quite unique because you can use all this information you gather from the track and use it in your global optimal race line. But it's not only about the path, because when you want to be fast in a race car, you don't get that necessarily only from the path. You get the speed mainly from the velocity. And here are two examples from having the friction value used and having it not used. When we have the friction value, what you can see here is that we have the possibility to brake later into turn one because we know there's a higher friction, so we can hit the brakes later and higher. Then we see that the friction area, like in comparison to like a standard friction, is quite similar in the second area. But we also see that we have like less braking and throttle before we go into turn three. That means even if we have this path, we don't know the velocity profile yet. So because on this path, we can drive like 10 meters per second, but we can also drive with 100 meters per second. You get the idea? This friction value gives you both the path and the velocity profile, and it's crucial for driving as fast as possible. So having this information right now, we can calculate that completely offline, and we can use that information every time we go back onto the racetrack. We plan then a local path around the, around the or like in real time, where we want to drive around obstacles. And that's like where, where we can input or we can create the multi vehicle interaction where we can overtake obstacles. That's where we like locally in real time calculate the path around other obstacles. And what we did here um, on the left side, what you can see, that's a so-called graph-based planner. So what we more or less do, we create a graph network like points and splines connected with each other. 
completely around the racetrack. So we can do that because we can gather the information offline. We can calculate that offline. And then what we do, we search for an optimal path only on this graph network here. So we get a wide variety of paths we can plan. And you can imagine, you can discretize that graph on your own, right? So it's up to you. You can make this wider, you can make this bigger. So the, the wider you make it, the less calculation time you need because you only have like a few splines. But then on the upper side, you don't have like enough space to drive around the other car. And what you can see on the right side is just a simulation environment of that. And um, so what you see that here are the lattices in the graph and that we are in this case overtaking another object. So we searching for the trajectories in this environment. And when we have found of one, one of those trajectories, the final thing we do is what we not applied, but what, what we did in research, we calculate a speed profile, but based on some energy calculations. Because again, here, only that we just know uh, this is like the path. It doesn't mean that we have like the best velocity profile around the track. So what we do in this case and what we created, as it was not applied on the car here, is um, an additional optimization problem also a nonlinear optimization problem where we optimize both the path and velocity profile with the energy parameter of the car. For example, the battery consumption, for example, the motor temperature, for example, even like the, if, the, if the motor is running into a saturation, we can model everything here and then use that information to make the car even faster. Or in that case, we can save energy while driving fast. So what you see here on the right side is that we provided the car only a certain amount of energy per lap. And you see that based on this nonlinear optimization, it optimizes everything, the path, the velocity profile, the um, energy that is drawn from the battery, as well as the, the, the power that is used from the, from the motors. And therefore, what you can do is more or less optimize everything for the next time step or for the next trajectory you calculate. Um, that's quite powerful. Um, of course, it was like not running on the car or not running on the semi car, but um, it was part of the research. Um, the last part, which is now missing, is the controller. And in, in case of the, the Indian Autonomous Challenge car, it was running a so-called tube MPC. So later in the lecture, we will learn about the model predictive controller. The model predictive controller is using a model of course, of our car, and is predicting into the future how the car might behave, is optimizing everything, and then giving you the optimal control input. That's what MPC is doing. And in this case, the so-called tube MPC is constraining the car with a certain area of where it can drive, or where we think it might be inside there with all the disturbances scared. So when you think about the track, you say like, okay, maybe the car will drift like half a meter to the left and half a meter to the right. That's what you use as a constraint for the optimization problem. And this guarantees you that you stay every time inside this tube. So that's also like a powerful update to the normal MPC. Um, and yeah, it gives you like the, the correct behavior of the car that it drives inside um, this tube. And more or less, that's when you put all these software components together, then you have like a software that can drive the car. Um, and therefore, I come to the, to the um, next part, is like what we did in simulation testing. So we had a look at, yeah, of what other teams, like especially Formula One teams doing and what startups, software startups doing. And one of the first things we figured out is like early integration full stack testing is super crucial. And similar to what a Formula One team does, if you don't test your car, you will not be successful on the racetrack. So early testing was quite crucial. We created some continuous integration and automated software pipelines, automated parameter tuning, and finally some complex um, simulation environments. And to give you an idea how this looks like, that's the simulator ANSYS provided for this EV Autonomous Challenge. And now the car is running in simulation of at around like 300 kilometers an hour. And we are doing now here multi-vehicle interaction path planning on this Indianapolis motor speedway. And that's quite interesting. So the simulator itself, I just replay that. Um, the simulator itself was not that good, 
but it gave us the opportunity to test everything in this environment because we had the possibility to have multiple cars running. So multiple softwares from other teams were running in the same environment. Um, the next thing I want to show you now is then when it came, yeah, to test the real car. And that was like in Indianapolis, it was one of the first tests where we then put the, the software on the car. And yeah, you see that's like all the software components I just showed you working now together on the real hardware is gathering sensor data, is, is driving the vehicle completely autonomously around the race track. It was quite, quite impressive. Also, it's like very slow. Um, quite impressive to see that everything works together. And then, for example, we moved on. And what you can see here is now one of the first invasion maneuvers, like where the car needs to detect an object here in the box. And then you see it moves to the right side. And what you also see here is that it's going from the outside back to the inside again, because that's the fastest line. And you see that even better when we did one of the first tests uh, with two cars. So what you see here is like one of the um, first autonomous overtaking maneuvers uh, with these Indy cars. You see like our cars in the upper left and the other cars like on the inside. And what you see now that this car is doing the overtaking maneuver and going back to the inside again. Um, I just replay that. We have like another look again. Um, so again, the other car is staying in the inside. This was like planned. But what the blue car is doing is completely planning its path, detecting the objects, localizing itself, and then going back to the, to the inside again. And one video um, I showed the people from the class already. Uh, I just show it again. That's like in Indianapolis, where the car is now driving on the racetrack. And um, you see in the, the upper right corner and uh, the down right corner, um, see the sensor data gathered from the LiDAR. See the car is going into the turn. And what you see now um, is that the car is losing its traction because we had some miscalculation in the friction. Um, or more or less, there was like an issue with the car where the turbocharger suddenly kicked in. Um, miscalibration in the turbocharger, I replay that again. And that exceeded more or less the friction level we had in this moment because the car was going full speed into the corner, and therefore the car spun out. Um, yeah, I was lucky that the car didn't crash. And you see that in the in the sensor data that was like very, very close to the wall. But yeah, that's that's what you what you get when you put all these software components together. And as I promised promised in the beginning, um, here is then one of the videos from the cars racing against each other. And those cars right now are driving 160 miles an hour, completely autonomously. And that was in Las Vegas. Um, where you see now our car is overtaking the other car. Um, it's also quite interesting because you have this high banking, um, which means you need to recalculate what kind of tire forces you can apply, maybe move to the outside, but not too fast, so you don't oversteer the car. Um, so it's quite difficult. And now what you see is that the other car is trying to overtake us. No, in that case, we like we're wrapping up. And now, what you see <laughs> that our car is spinning out because actually it had a misdetection in the object. So it thought the object is right in front of it. So it steered to the right um, and therefore was like, yeah, oversteer. That's motorsport. <laughs> so we lost this race one here, uh, but it, I think it's quite impressive to see that these cars are running because, and that's the last slide. Uh, for the section here. Um, on the left side, you see a simulation environment, and on the right side, you see the real car. Okay, so we see both on the left side what we, what we can do in simulation and then on the real car. And from my perspective, that was like very, very important to do that because um, only from having these heavy simulation environments, learning from simulation, then applying it to the real car, and then looping it back in the simulation is the only way that you can learn. A lot because only that you just think like oh i found this algorithm and i understood it and somebody made five years ago a good job in the theory it does not mean that it runs on time. i promise you and <laughs> that's what you see like in your f1 head start too um so having this kind of loop um where you have like this adversarial testing with other vehicles is like very very crucial 
Um, I come to the last part for today. Um, first of all, I want to show like if, what you could think about is like what is what is the future doing in this field. So what we figured out is like some challenges is big dynamics knowledge and road fiction knowledge, detecting that information um, with a, like this this high frequency having this kind of knowledge gives you the opportunity to use it in the path planner, in the velocity planner, in the MPC wherever, but having these kind of knowledge of your car is very crucial. And the faster you can detect it, the better you can calculate all these components, plan, path plan, velocity plan. Number three is control at and beyond the limits. Um, today, I only talk about like controlling the car to track this um, these, these, these trajectory, but what research showed is that the race driver, the, the human race driver exceeding the limit all the time. So um, Lewis Hamilton is driving, he knows that's a trajectory I want to drive, but he's going over it and knows, okay, the next time, this is where I need to go. I need a little bit, I need to go a little bit beyond that. But in our case, controlling beyond the limits from an autonomous point of view, quite difficult. We are not there yet. Number three, real-time capable code. Um, again, just because you found something online which is like super sophisticated, if it runs slow, it's nothing for your race car. Number five, sim to real gap. We need to simulate, but if the simulator is not good enough, you cannot learn for driving at the limits because you only can learn from driving at the limits if you model the limits in your simulator. And number three, and number six, that's what you see every time when you work on your Alpha car or working with free hardware. That's why we do this. Um, I want to show you only because it runs the simulation doesn't mean it runs on the real car because they're like, Quite some issues if it's the sensor data, for example, or if it's the, the ROS, the middleware. But if you're interested, and I mean, we have like a lot of people here that, that work with us right now. So we have the F10 ROS and ROS2 environment, which we use. We have all the gym environment. There's like Donkey Car Simulator. Then we have the SDL Simulator. And even the people from Formula Student Driverless um, publish the simulation environment. So the community is out there, people contributing every time, so you can start right away. And what is also cool about is that we have um, people like we from the F1 Hens community, the TOM people, um, Alex Liniger from ETH, or um, even the AMZ team, everyone is publishing and releasing their code. So you don't like not re need to reinvent the wheel, you just need to search a little bit because the community is quite big. And that brings me to my, my last point for today, because it happens a lot this year. So um, we have our race um, at ICO, and I can encourage everybody to join us, um, especially our f people, because I think you do an awesome job in your class. Uh, why not show everybody how, how good you really are? And we are here to support you. And then we have a workshop at ICRA where we invited researchers from all over the world, big researchers, um, very interesting people that talk about autonomous racing. We have the CPS week, which is unfortunately in Italy. I'm not sure if we travel to Italy, so we focus <laughs> rather on ITRA. We have the DIY Robocar events in California happening four times. We have Formula Student. And if you want to like keep in touch with the autonomous racing topic, then the company Robo Race is doing it season one. And therefore, I'm at the end of my talk. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And looking forward to yeah, answer all your questions if you have some. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Johannes. That was uh, really eye-opening. Um, as a car racing fan myself, uh, I, thought, I thought it was uh, great to hear all the different aspects that uh, kind of converge from F1 to what's going to happen in the future with mm -hmm. autonomous racing. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to open it up for questions now for the 20. Um, and uh, online, if you guys have any questions, either raise or comment, uh, raise your hand or comment. And in person, of course, just uh, raise your hand and we'll go through them. Oops. Uh, so like, you had the time trial and then you have a real race. So yep. like, like I know in like real Formula One, they have, like I think the time trial is really important for placing and then you're basically going at like max speed the entire time. So, but, like in this, are you really not going max speed? Because that would be like, like a DRS. Like, like, Correct. Yeah. Yeah.
first of all, those cars don't have DRS. Um, that's number one, because those cars, the, the, the lights vehicle, they are quite basic from their setup perspective, more or less focusing on let's just race. Um, the second thing is that the high speed in this car was just reached once. So again, here the teams are not quite there to drive at this high speed all the time. And um, number three is, um, it's, it's a research area. So um, the, the car itself costs a million dollars and with, with the support from companies, the teams have spent 300K. So um, we saw like the crashes I showed you in the, in the beginning. Um, and that's like when you see one of those cars crashing into the wall, it's like 20k. <laughs> so, so the high, high speed racing was um, something everybody strives for, but didn't happen. Yeah, yeah. that's the Dutch that's reasons. Great. Um, on, yeah. Thank you. Sure. All right. So I see a hand online. Yi Duan, uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, yeah, I, I just want to ask, uh, uh, what is the yeah, uh, what is the specific competition computational power required for the online calculation for the local planner? But based on the uh, pictures you showed, I think I got the answer. Yeah, the, the computation like how many uh, what what is uh, what type of the CPU and how many CPUs? Yeah, uh, in the in your previous previous picture, I see the yeah, I see the. So I think I got the, got the answer. Thanks. Okay, I think the question was like the computational effort. So yeah. if you just just for everybody here, so that graph planner on an ARM architecture was running at 16.8 hertz, which seems in the beginning quite slow. Um, in the Indy car, we had an Intel chip which sped up uh, the complete calculation twice the time. So it was like at 30 hertz. But that 30 hertz was totally enough because of the plan long planning horizon you have with the vehicle. Mm -hmm. To recalculate everything. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks for the explanation. Yeah. yeah you're welcome. Um, my question is uh, related to the prediction model that you spoke about. Yeah. So you said that the prediction model uh, learn, is online and keeps learning during the rest as well. Yeah. So, what would the reason be behind that? Like, why not? Because there's obviously a computation to a cost attached to it. So, is it like to handle blocking maneuvers and Stuff like that from the yeah. open. So the, the thing is, you when you train your network offline, right? Mm -hmm. You create you, you you get a bunch of data, and in this data, your cars behave specifically what this data is has recorded. So if you, for example, never seen uh, a stupid maneuver of the car or a specific driver related maneuver you will not capture it if you only use the offline trained data. So with this online network, you get the possibility to catch this individual driving behavior of this car only. And that, for example, could be that is like waving a little bit. So in that time step where you see the car, you overfit to its specific driver behavior. You can think about, for example, um, you, it's raining outside and one car is like driving a little bit slowly or driving a little bit to the left. That would be specific driving behavior. Or somebody is hitting aggressively the brakes, one car and the other car not. And therefore, you capture this um, specific driving behavior of one car. So, does that include like a pretty important unlearning for a part of it as well? Like you learn something from the previous car, yeah. previous opponent, and then you move on to the next one, you're trying to offer it to the new car. So, yeah. Do you try to forget some of the. Like, so you do, you do, you do. If if that car is gone, you more or less unclip all the behavior and right. overfit yeah. to the next car. So you have like this, let's say 80% level you learned online and the last 20% you get for one specific car, then you forget that and update it afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, so when we when we detect the, the object of another car, uh, we first of all detect its position, but also estimate its velocity and acceleration based on the, the data you see here. So you get the autometry, but only with a certain uncertainty. Yeah. Because you need that afterwards for the prediction. 
Yeah, in that case, no, unfortunately not, because it was more like let's get the car to race and let's do um, a good overtake. So what you see, for example, um, and you probably might see that in in that video here. So what you see here is our car had the tactics to drive as, as, as long as behind the other car to get the drag and then moves to the outside. That was like our specific tactic maneuver. And what you will see now, what the other car is doing, as soon as we did the overtaking maneuver and it gets the information that it's allowed to overtake, it moves completely to the right. It's not using the drag. You will see that probably right now, um, it's moving now to the right side already, okay? And um, because their tactic was to go to the other side and speed up the car. Like similar to let's move to the other lane, just overtake us and then move to the inside again. So that was like some different tactics and so on. Is this the, like the format of the race where one car overtakes That was, the other was the format here, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What? You know what so that spin off more or less happened, and I could just uh, replay that. I mean, take some time. So in that case, what what we had is a misdetection of the other car. So the position of the other car was not correct, uh, not detected correctly. We thought it's closer to us. So what the car started a replanning and started like an evasive maneuver, which was in that case too much for the time to explain. 